hemostasis is normal blood clotting. This is what's supposed to happen when there's an injury to a blood vessel. Um, you know, your, your body sort of knows that there's a problem. It has to stop the leak. And this is really an enormously complicated process. So if you think about what really goes on, there's a place in your body where blood is becoming a solid thing. It's clotting. And while that's happening, everywhere else it has to keep moving. So that's, that's really quite a trick. It's like freezing half of an ice cube and keeping the rest of it liquid. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not so easy to pull this off. And this is an enormously complicated system, and that's partly why there are so many ways it can go wrong. So this is a continuous, dynamic interaction between many, many things. Part of it involves the blood vessel wall. Part of it involves proteins that are dissolved in the blood. And then the platelets, which are the cells that circulate in the body to help initiate the clotting process. There's a, a very complicated interaction between all of these parts of the coagulation system that helps achieve what we call normal hemostasis. And when that doesn't happen normally, when it happens excessively, we have thrombosis. So this cartoon um, sort of illustrates the four-step process that, that we think about when we think about how blood clots. So uh, the first step is primary hemostasis. And this is really platelets coming in uh, and plugging up the hole. So in the cartoon here, this is a, a blood vessel. Um, and these little purple guys are platelets. And there's been an injury here. Your body somehow can recognize that. Platelets come in, stick to that spot, plug up the hole. So the initial line of defense against bleeding um, is the formation of this platelet plug. The second thing that this is important for is these platelets then provide the surface upon which the coagulation proteins interact with each other to form a clot. So that's the second step, or secondary hemostasis. It's a really complicated series of reactions, but the end result is the generation of what we call thrombin. And thrombin is this sort of sticky glue-like stuff that lays down on top of that platelet plug and keeps that clot in place. And it keeps it in place long enough for the tissue underneath to heal um, so that the bleeding is stopped and the tissue can heal and everything is, everything is back to normal. This process has to get shut off. The third step is, is once you get this all whipped up, you have to stop it. And as it turns out, many of the genetic thrombophilias, the problem is we don't have a good enough stop mechanism. So, there are all kinds of defects in all of the proteins and all the systems that regulate this clotting process, whereby once it gets turned on and activated, your body has a harder time shutting it off. And that leads to excessive generation of clot, which can turn into thrombosis. So primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, the whole thing's got to stop and shut off when, when enough of a clot has been made. And then the last step is the step that I think we all kind of forget about, and that's, that's called fibrinolysis. And what that means is dissolving of the clot. So once, once the tissue underneath has had a chance to heal, you don't want that clot to sit there forever, or it becomes a place where there's abnormal flow around it, it's a, it's a narrowing of the blood vessel. And, and when you have things like that in your body, there tends to be a tendency for other clots to form on or around that area. So once the tissue is healed underneath, you want that clot to go away. This is um, probably the least well understood um, of these four steps, but it's becoming increasingly clear that problems with clot dissolving or problems with fibrinolysis might actually have a lot to do with some of the, the clotting tendencies that we see. And I think in the next five years, we're going to see a lot more information. There's a lot of research going on right now at a very basic science level, trying to understand the fibrinolytic pathways and how they might key into excess thrombosis. So there's more to come on that. Just a couple of pictures to, to show you what this looks like in, in real life. Um, this first picture represents primary hemostasis. So this is an electron micrograph. This is the in, inside of a blood vessel here. Um, this is the, the wall of the blood vessel, and there's been an injury right here. There's a disruption between the normal cells that hold all this together. And these are platelets coming in to, to plug up that hole. So you can imagine blood oozing out of here. These platelets come in, stick to that spot, form a surface upon which your body can lay down a clot. And that's what's shown in this picture here. So this, these, this gray, strandy, net-like net, net -like stuff is fibrin. And fibrin is, is the end result of the coagulation cascade. You generate thrombin, which cleaves fibrinogen to fibrin, and you get this net-like thing that gets laid down. And underneath of all that are trapped red blood cells, trapped platelets, and that's really what hold, that's the glue that holds the whole clot together. So, so that's what it looks like in real life. This process of hemostasis, as I touched on before, is enormously complicated. And to try to summarize it in one slide is difficult, but I, I think this may be a pretty good try. Um, it, it's a balancing act, really, is what it is. We have to balance a lot of things in order to have everything be okay. So in the center here, we have the four steps that we've been talking about, primary hemostasis, secondary hemostasis, regulating that process or shutting it off when it's done its job, and then eventually the clot dissolving. And all of that is kept in balance. 
and, and when that's the case, everything is fine. You're not bleeding, you're not clotting, everything is just as it ought to be. As it turns out, though, there are a lot of things that can tip the balance one way or the other. So there are genetic factors, there are certain diseases or medical conditions that come along, there are medications that we give people that sometimes tip the balance one way or the other. And uh, for purposes of today's talk, we're talking about the balance being tipped towards thrombosis. So uh, this is a fairly complicated system, but I think if you think about it as a balance and, and things tipping it out of balance, leading towards a tendency to thrombosis, um, that's how we end up with the problems that we see in the clinic. The idea of, of, of trying to prevent clots is to try to keep that balance, you know, tip it back up the other way. So when we have genetic factors or conditions that come along that want to tip the balance towards clotting, there's things we can do to kind of prop it up, so to speak, and keep everything level so that we don't have inappropriate clotting.